Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. G'day. My name is Adam Jones. <laughs> and uh, we just spoke to the magnificent Matthew Michael Witch. What a cool dude. What a cool dude. So the author of Life in Half a Second, who we just spoke to. So last week we did uh, How to Achieve Success Before It's Too Late. So Matthew started off, he studied finance. He built a little personal training business to help him uh, pay his way through college. And then he's gone on to build and sell four other businesses. The last one he sold for tens of millions. Yeah. And now he's building one that he wants to float on the on the uh, stock exchange. Yeah. So he's a dude who's in a hurry to live. We hope you guys enjoy listening as much as we enjoyed speaking to him. Yeah. And he's also given out a couple of freebies. So if you jump onto his site, lifeinhalfasecond.com slash challenge, he's got a free video series to go through the five steps. And there's also somehow attached to this episode a free PDF of the uh, the first chapter of the book, which is bloody amazing. It's incredible. All right, let's get stuck in. Let's get into him. Matthew, good morning. It's uh, it's Adam and Adam. Hey, you going, mate? Good morning, guys. How are you? <laughs> good, thank you. We realize you're... Um, son is also Adam. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Absolutely. So it's a name I'm very fond of. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that. Mate, we have to ask you, how, how do you pronounce your surname? We've heard you a few times on YouTube and we've heard Michael Witz, Michael Witz, Michael. Yeah, Michael Witz, like, uh, like the name Michael and then Witch, like uh, Witch on a Broomstick. <laughs> Michael Witz. There's a, a lot of people seem to get that wrong. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, the, and uh, what they end up doing is they focus on the last name and then end up calling me Michael. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> we'll stick that's with, usually we'll what happens. So, uh, yeah, thanks for your time, mate. We reviewed your book last week and we both thought it was, especially the first 12 pages, was so, some of the best uh, content I've read in, in any book before. And it kind of, um, the effect on, it had on me personally was it, it's kind of a kick up the butt to, uh, yeah, just get out there and do something. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, and I, I mean, not many people know, but I actually wrote uh, the opening as the end, and and then oh. when the reviewers read it, they said, "Oh, that should really be the opening." So that got moved to the front, and then I, I wrote the, you know, what is now kind of the conclusion, the ending. So, yeah. um, the, the the reviewers said it was the best part of the book, and it should be at the beginning. <laughs> I did, well, that's, I reckon that was a good call. <laughs> that was a good call for sure. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, so, Matt, you're a author, speaker. Uh, serial entrepreneur, mentor, father. So you, it sounds like you're in, in a bit of a hurry to live. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you. I mean, you never know, kind of, uh, when your time is up, and uh, if you, when when your time does come up, if you feel like you've really done a lot or done the most in the time that was given to you, I think it's a good feeling. So, I've had uh, in my life, even recently, I've had several friends pass away that were you know, late 30s or mid 30s or early 40s and so forth. And you always have the kind of sensation, Jesus, if they knew that that was going to happen, they would have lived their life in a, in a maybe not a dramatically different way, but certainly they wouldn't have deferred and pushed things back. So it's kind of a philosophy that uh, um, has stuck with me over the years. Yeah. And did, uh, did you always have this philosophy or growing up or did you have a mentor that kind of pushed you in this direction? Um, gosh, that's a good question. I'm, it's probably a combination. So I've always um, had mentors, and not in a formal sense where, you know, I ask someone, will you be my mentor? Let's meet on a regular basis, and you will mentor me. It was just people that were a lot older and had uh, significant experience, whether it was life experience, but typically business experience. They had built businesses, gone through the things that I kind of wanted to go through. And I and I uh, developed relationships with them and spent time with them. We had lunch once a month and so on. So I was certainly influenced by those people because they were significantly older than me. Sometimes, you know, I was early 20s and they might be 60s. So it's a very significant age gap. And they would often talk about uh, regrets that they had in life, you know, that they hadn't spent enough time with kids or they d- didn't do this or they had a real passion for X, Y, Z when they were growing up but never did anything about it because they were afraid that they might fail in it. And I think there's, because I really looked up to those people and spent time with them, I think I was heavily influenced by that kind of viewpoint, the older person's viewpoint. And it came to me when I was a sponge and I was very young. So even though I can't put my finger on the exact moment or the exact date, I think that was the influencing factor. Yeah. Yeah, nice. And so we'll, we'll, we're keen to talk about your businesses, but even before business, you had a, 
uh, a different passion, a different desire before that. You want to be uh, the next Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I've always held fitness very, very close to my heart. So I, I, I remember the day I discovered Arnold, my father took me to the movie theater to see Commando. And if uh, anyone hasn't seen that movie, they should, uh, you know, stop <laughs> listening, to, stop have listening to this podcast and, and go watch it. He <laughs> kills his daughter and he kills a thousand people to get her back. It's probably oh, the, the, the best yeah, movie no, of all time. Never, oh. when I'm, yeah, when I made the discovery, I, I was so in awe of him. Um, and, uh, and that kind of set uh, in motion the passion for fitness and and even success from that point. I began reading his books and listening to kind of the content he had created, and it was all success-driven, goal-focused, uh, make the most of your life, um, and, and so on. So it was good, very positive and good messages for me kind of growing up as a kid. Yeah, nice. And, when, and you... Uh... You said you got into the the encyclopedia. His big uh, his big forearm workout. You called it the big book. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Started, My, uh... Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was. I got that book when I was fourteen or uh, or thirteen. Got it's a good thousand pages, and um, yeah, I've I've still got photos in my own gym, my house from that original encyclopedia. I had cut them off um, out of the pages, put them in my house, or or uh, wherever I'd lived with my parents at the time. And then as we moved, and then as I moved out and got married, I kind of took those pictures with me, and now they're in my gym, in my house. So they got some age on them, but it was a, it's a great book and one that's <laughs> that I'm very fond of. Unreal. So, uh, yeah, growing up, you, you mentioned in the book you were on the course where you go and do a, a graduate program for a, a corporate company, and uh, but you ended up taking the direction of going down the entrepreneurial path. Mm-hmm. Can you explain what uh, what was involved with that decision? Was there a lot of fear going down the entrepreneurial path, or was it? Was no, it... no. I, mean, I, I think it was quite the opposite. I, I was first an entrepreneur um, by when I turned eighteen. I had to pay my way through college, and the only thing that I could do to earn, you know, more money than minimum wage, you know, flipping burgers at McDonald's, was to use the knowledge that I had developed at the time around fitness, around training nutrition and so forth and I got certified as a personal trainer and began a very small personal training business. It was first first myself and then a few other trainers. So um, it was an incredibly good experience for a number of reasons. One, I I felt like I had freedom. I could make my own decisions. No one was telling me when to be at work and uh, and what days I would work and and so on. So I felt like I, I was in control of my own life rather than somebody else was in control of my life. And the second thing that was really good is it allowed me to do something that I really enjoyed doing. So I don't think anyone can honestly say that they enjoy flipping burgers at McDonald's <laughs> for eight, eight, ten hours a day. And, and you know, if someone does say that, I think, I think they're lying. So mm. th- whereas this, well, I didn't spend eight, ten hours a day training people, but the time that I did spend training people, maybe it was three or four hours a day, I really enjoyed it. I felt like I was making a difference in their life. I talked about things that I was myself passionate about. So that was my introduction to entrepreneurship. And when I graduated from college, it, the corporate path was so certain and fixed. Mm-hmm. And it was like a trajectory that if you enter this corporation and you work really hard and you excel, this is where you'll be in three years and in six years and in nine and and so on. It, 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 and someone else is going to tell you what to do and work on. You have a boss. You have these annual reviews. And that was so unappealing Sounds versus awesome. <laughs> kind of the last four years of college of not, not having those things, yeah. having a dream and make kind of feeling like whatever you want to do, you can do. You can wake up tomorrow and change the direction of your business. You can try to expand it. You could try to do this. So it, it, once I became an entrepreneur and kind of lived that life, so I, I feel like it was impossible for me to fit into the corporate world. Yeah. So do you think it's that point where... Uh where people get into the corporate world that they they shut the box on their dream box which you talk about in the book or or how do we how do we lose touch with our dream box usually you think yeah i um i'm going to write a book gosh when when i have time but hopefully it'll be over the next you know couple of years which is about how people in corporations can leave and kind of start their business so it's a book about become how to become an entrepreneur if you are in a corporate and, uh, and, you know, you're stuck in a job that you might not be crazy about. You've got a passion or a dream. You've never been an entrepreneur before. What should you do first? There's a lot of misconceptions about that. Should I quit my job first? Should I do this mm. and so on? 
So it's a subject that I, I spend time um, with corporate people because I, I've run software businesses where I sell into corporate, so I've spent a lot of time with them. And I think the, to answer your question specifically, the feeling that I get from these people is that once they enter the corporate world, they um, saddle themselves with obligations. You know, there's the mortgage on the house, there's the loan on the car, then there's a marriage, there's a child, there's tuitions at schools and so forth. And the corporate lifestyle provides that uh, certainty or at least that illusion of certainty that you're going to have that paycheck and, you know, you can pay your bills and so forth. And then, then it becomes very, very difficult to kind of break that paradigm and say, okay, now I'm going to follow my passion because to follow your passion, you might have to get rid of the job, which provides the income, which pays mm -hmm. for all of the obligations that you've developed. And that becomes kind of the trap that, and, and the obligations grow in time. Kids get older, there's more kids, there's greater tuitions, there's, you know, a bigger house, a bigger car, and so forth. So I feel like people just fall into this trap where it becomes very difficult and very risky for them to go and step out and pursue something. Whereas when I was 18, I didn't have any of those obligations. There was, I lived with my parents, I didn't have a house, I wasn't married, I didn't have kids. So it was really easy and much less risk involved in becoming an entrepreneur and in doing something you're, you're passionate about. Yep. I can't wait to read that book. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, definitely review it. I love it. So you, you spoke about how Arnie set the, the foundations of setting goals and, and achieving them and then you had your first business in personal training. Uh, what... I know you've gone on to do some uh, some bigger businesses from there. Can you tell us a little bit about your your business journey, your story uh, in in the business sense? Yeah, so absolutely, and I, and I think I'm an unlikely entrepreneur where I didn't you know grow. No one in my family is an entrepreneur, so I don't have anyone to kind of look up to. And my parents were academics, um, and and there was not that role model in the family where, gosh, someone's a business person. They, whatever kind of business, you know, a restaurant, a retailer, it doesn't matter. There just wasn't that kind of um, role model. So the way it happened is it happened out of necessity where there was a big gap between what I needed to earn to pay for college, to have a car, to be able to go on dates, to kind of afford a basic lifestyle and, you know, to not live like a rat. And, uh, and the types of jobs that were available. So if I was going to flip burgers at McDonald's for 40 or 50 hours a week, A, I don't know how I would study because there'd be so little time left. But mm -hmm. even then, I really wouldn't earn enough to cover those obligations. So it created this kind of environment in my head. What do I need to do to kind of close that gap? And the only way that I could think of was to become an entrepreneur. I didn't even think of it as an entrepreneur. I mean, I didn't discover that mm -hmm. word until years later. It was to create a business and offer a service that people needed and they were going to pay more for that service than you could earn doing something else that, that you didn't enjoy. So in that um, fitness business, even though it was a really basic business, it's you know, providing a service to people that want to get in shape or um, eat better or whatever the case might be, it per laid the foundation of real business mechanics. And what I mean by that is, cash flow management and branding and business cards and a telephone and, and advertising and making people aware of what you offer, um, partnerships. I had to have a partnership with a gym to be able to take people there and train them. It uh, made me think of legal things. What if I train someone and they get injured? Am I covered? What happens if they sue me? Then there's your employees and, and uh, managing their expectations and all of that kind of stuff. So in hindsight, it laid all of the fundamental skills that you need to kind of run your own business. Mm -hmm. And that kind of set the ground for things that I did later. Yeah, fantastic. And what, what did you go on to later? Well, when I, I, my degree from college is in uh, finance, and I ended up creating a money management and stock brokerage firm with one of my clients from the personal training business. And that was how we met. And so I left college, we created this company together, CFG Investments, and it was fantastic because, again, it combined two things, freedom, um, un, you know, unbridled uh, ability to dream and, and have goals and ambitions and you know, sit down with my business partner and say, gosh, you know, what should, where should we take this business? Where do we want to be next year? I, I loved that kind of freedom, that, that, that um, 
sensation that there's a lot of room to move. No one's limiting you. Yeah. Yeah, the only limitation is really in your head. So, um, and the second thing is I really developed a liking for finance. It's what I studied in college. It's not accounting, which, which I actually didn't like, but finance is, is all about how money works, and it's, it's the stock market, and it's the valuation of businesses, and, and so on. So I really developed a liking for that. And again, the next business ended up enabling me to combine those two things. All the skills I developed in, in the fitness business, the passion and, and uh, the love that I had developed for finance, and the freedom that entrepreneurship brings. Yep. Mm-hmm. Unreal. So uh, what's, what's in store for you for the future, for your future projects or, or goals? Is there? Yeah, so it, it combines a variety of things. After that fitness business, I moved into technology, and I've had three tech businesses. So that was almost 20 years ago, yep. and uh, the, the last two have been sold. Both of them grew to about 200 people and, uh, and were sold to major um, corporations. And now I'm on to the third which is growing quite rapidly, and I'd like to develop it into something more substantial than the, the last two tech businesses. You know, float it, make it into a public company, okay. have uh, create something that outlives me, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and it's not something that you kind of hand off to a corporation for a sack of money and they do whatever they want with it. They they destroy your brand or they you know rebrand it. They change the culture. All the because a business is is your creation. It's like your baby. You've nurtured it. You've put your heart and soul into it. Everything you believe as a human being is inside this thing that you've created. And when you sell it, yes, for outsiders, it looks like a you know sensational success. You, you get paid a lot of money, but it's heart-wrenching at the same time because you take this thing that you love and you give mm. it to someone else. And what they end up doing with it can be completely contrary to your beliefs, values, and what you would have done with it. Yep. So I think this current company that I'm running, Complexica, is the business, and it's it's using artificial intelligence to help big businesses really optimize sales and marketing activities. And it will be the thing that I try to turn into a public company and make it bigger than the things I've done in the past. Wow. That's so amazing. so you <laughs> mentioned uh, <clears throat> artificial intelligence. Do you think that the next 20 years is going to be completely different to the past 20 years, or or how is it going to be different? You think? Yeah, I certainly agree with that statement. I mean, the, if you look at, first of all, there's a couple of things that are happening. There's exponential innovation and change happening in the world. So not only is the next 20 years going to be different, but the rate of change and innovation is going to be so much greater than the last 20 years. So I feel like all of these technological revolutions like the internet or uh, mobile computing that we've all got a phone in our hand and wireless broadband and all of that kind of stuff people have viewed those as the technological revolution i really view them as just building blocks for the real technological revolution that's going to come so you've got computing power you've got mobile devices you've got internet speed connectivity everything is becoming cheaper and becoming commoditized algorithmic power like artificial intelligence is rapidly increasing as well and all of that is converging into things like driverless cars or uh, drones that deliver things and so forth. So I believe that the real revolution, the real changes that technology will bring will happen in the next 20 years and will benefit from these building blocks that we've developed over the last 20 or 30 years, like the Internet. Yep. That's amazing because you look back and think at the last 20 years and see all the, the change, but if that's only the uh, just scratching the surface, if that's a building block, it's going to be an exciting 20 years to come by the sounds of it. Yeah, for some people I think it will be exciting. For others it will be threatening and disorienting. There's a book, I think it's the best-selling book on Amazon of all time, Who Moved My Cheese, and <laughs> about you know change and people's um, desire to prevent change or, uh, or not be part of it. And I think I, I, people, all people are going to experience change, whether it's workers mm-hmm. and companies, whether it's executives, whether it's businesses themselves, people at home, how they order things, how the refrigerator gets replenished. Just everything. So I think change is going to be the theme of the next 20 years and how people cope with that change and how their, what their mindset is towards that change. Do they receive it positively or do they try to resist it? Are they negative towards it? Will determine whether it's an exciting time or a stressful time or a very unpleasant time. 
Yeah, that's good. We didn't set you up for that one, but we uh, we're actually doing Who Moved My Cheese this this weekend. We just finished reading it. <laughs> so I've read it a few times. It's a, it's, a, it's a good read, and it ca- it captures the essence of different personality types yeah, towards that's change. That's for sure. That's Unreal. A, that sounds good. I'm actually I'm keen to hear a bit more about Complexica. So you said you're using AI to uh, help other businesses. Did you say? Yeah, so it, it, I mean, the easiest way to think about it is the use of artificial intelligence plus big data, big data inside of a company and on the internet to help salespeople sell more. So typically it's large companies that have lots of products, lots of salespeople and lots of customers and the use of AI and the interpretation in real time of all of the data, what you're selling, what your customers are buying. It reads uh, social media profiles of customers. It looks at if your customers are, for example, pubs and restaurants and cafes, it would read their menus. It would read their uh, websites, cocktail lists, um, social media feeds. It would look at what you're selling to those customers. And then the AI algorithms would determine what you should be offering at what exact price to what customer at what time, which is very, very difficult for large companies to do because you could have 100,000 products 100,000 customers, and you might have 1,000 salespeople, and those combinations of what product, what price, uh, what customer at what time is very difficult to work out. Mm-hmm. And this is going to be your, you said a big build to a, uh, hopefully a public float on the stock exchange. When yeah, you... so we're close, yeah, we're close to 30 people now. It's about um, two and a half years into the journey. We mm-hmm. spent a year and a half building, maybe even closer to two years, the base product and kind of... Uh, uh, extending applications that corporations will benefit from. Um, there's a whole long news section on our website, which is complexica.com, with uh, you know big hires or deals that we've won and so on. But it's following that kind of trajectory of my previous software businesses where you have an idea, you validate it, you build a prototype, then you get some early customers and you develop the prototype into a product, you deploy, you gain references, you build out your team, you gain some marketing, awareness for what you're doing, then you win some bigger deals, you, you hire more people, etc. So it's, it's following a predictable pattern that I've been through before, but because times have changed and artificial intelligence has gotten mainstream attention and awareness and big companies are very interested in it and looking towards it, it's, it's perhaps moving faster than the things uh-huh. I've done previously. There's less of an education required for, for people, for companies really when you go and talk mm-hmm. to them. Fantastic. That sounds, uh, I'm looking forward to that one. That sounds good. Unreal, mate. So uh, what, is, what is the, you mentioned who moved your cheese as an influence in your life. Do you have any other books or what, what's the book you've recommended to people the most in, in your life? Yeah, so there's, there's a few that I really enjoy. There's an author, um, Stephen Johnson, um, best-selling author. He wrote uh, Where Good Ideas Come From, which is uh, one of my favorites. There's uh, Jeffrey Moore with Crossing the Chasm, which is almost a playbook of how to execute on a, on a new disruptive business or on a technology business. Um, I love uh, Robert Greene's books, whether they're yeah. Mastery or uh, you know, 48 Laws of yeah. Power and, and so on. <laughs> so there's, there's a few like that that I really enjoy. And I also love fiction books from classical writers, whether it's Mark Twain or Jack London or Alexander Dumas and, uh, and so forth. There's nothing as good as, you know, settling back with a glass of wine and reading The Three Musketeers or uh, the, the, the Count of Monte Cristo. I think it, it, it refreshes your mind and it also takes you into an era that I think is uh, forgotten and lost in the modern world. So those are probably some that I really enjoy. Yeah, that sounds phenomenal. There's a, a few we can add to our list uh, for the next couple of yeah, months. Plan. Well, now let, let's talk about your book, Life in Half a Second. Uh, yeah. How to achieve success before it's too late. So we did a we did about a 25 minute uh, review of it. Can you give us a just give us a I guess a nutshell, a, a quick three minute uh, overview of of the five steps. Yeah, so I've. Uh, because I've been an entrepreneur, as I mentioned, from a very young age, the odds are stacked against you when you're an entrepreneur. 50% of new companies fail within the first two or three years, and uh, and those that survive, another 50 of those fail in the next you know, three or four years, mm-hmm. whatever it is. So I became really interested as a young person in something that could give me an edge, balance out the odds, or give me an advantage. So through mentors, through just renting books at the library, 
My father was a university professor, and I would go and sit in on lectures on various subjects. I just became interested in the subject of success. And over 20 years or so, I collected, gosh, hundreds, if not more than a 1,000 uh, different studies that had been written by universities on different subjects, placebo studies, mm. uh, sports performance studies, psychological studies, behavioral studies, um, business performance studies, and so forth. And then I also read a lot of these books um, that were written by motivational uh, speakers and authors and so forth, and some that just were written by obscure authors that were interested in a narrow subject like you know, um, behavioral psychology in, in sports or, or something like that. And from all of that, I kind of distilled five factors that I thought really just all of this material was just regurgitating or providing a different uh, opinion, perspective, or angle on the five same factors. Whatever study I picked up, it, just, it always came back to one of these five. Mm -hmm. And it was really goal setting, so being clear about what your objective is. The second one is, is, I call it desire, but it's how much you want something because that dictates how much effort you will put into it. Belief, the third one, which is mindset. It's what you believe, and I've discovered through all these studies that what you believe will actually dictate your actions. It's more mm -hmm. important than even what's real. The fourth one was knowledge. Very difficult to achieve anything if you don't know how to do it. And the last one was action, a systematic way of taking action on a daily basis that moves you towards the goal that you've set. So I, I thought it's, when I sold the last company, I had, I kid you not, filing cabinets of all of this stuff I've collected. So most of it was turning yellow um, <laughs> from age, and I thought, God, I've got the time. I'll put it into a book, and, uh, and, and hence life and half a second came out of that. Yeah, amazing. Unreal, mate. So you mentioned just on door four, you said uh, uh, investment is, is uh, important, investing, investing in yourself. In yourself. What, are, what is the best investment you've ever made in yourself? I, th I think um, going back to the first substantial investment I made, it was in that fitness training business, and I, and I cover it in the book, but it was I remember it because it was so scary at the time. And um, I, I was uh, working, God, I can't remember, it was some, you know, Target stores or Kmart. I was yeah. making $4 an hour, $5 an hour, and I had saved up this very small amount of money, and, uh, and I realized that it would the way I was continuing working at that kind of job just wasn't going to cut it through college, to do anything, any of the things that I wanted to do, to travel, to date, to have a car, and so on. So I kind of searched or began thinking about what I could do, and I came up with the idea, God, I'll be a personal trainer. But to be a trainer, you have to be accredited. You have to be certified, or otherwise you're not a legitimate trainer. Mm -hmm. So especially me being very young, 18, I needed that accreditation to have enough credibility to be able to take on customers. And I needed it for insurance purposes and so on for the business. So to be an accredited trainer, I had to spend thousands of dollars on material courses and so forth to be, get into the position to take the exams, to get a national accreditation, and to be able to use that in my marketing and in the development of the business. And it was an enormously scary and frightful process, even though it, it doesn't seem like a lot in hindsight now, you know, some thousands of dollars, but at the time it represented absolutely everything, yep. and I had to get into credit card debt to cover the rest. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough to cover the whole thing. So that was a pure investment in myself, and in the end, it changed the trajectory of my life because mm. if I hadn't made that investment, I could have used that money to put a down payment on a car or buy a phone or a watch or do something silly, but <laughs> because I used that money to build an accreditation for myself personally, it allowed me to make a step change in my earning capability and allowed me to launch the first uh, business, even though it was a very small one. So that, if you to answer the question, what was the most important investment, it was that one. Yep. Yeah, and as you say, that uh, that first business gave you, gave you a taste for business that have, I guess has kick-started your, your desire for entrepreneurship that's, uh, that's gone on from there. Yeah, absolutely, because if you, if you go back to that point, if I hadn't made that investment, I wouldn't have been a trainer I would have continued in some menial job, maybe two years into college, I would have gotten an intern somewhere. I would have never had that entrepreneurial experience. I graduated near the top of my class in finance or, at, or even at the top of my class. So I would have gotten a good corporate job and then I would have been 
you know, for lack of a better word, this sounds horrible, but just like everyone else, in the <laughs> sense that I would have gotten married, gotten the obligations and so yeah. forth. So and that so investment put, up me in, <laughs> yeah, put me in a different trajectory. Yeah, that's amazing. Love it. Uh, <clears throat> are there any other, other questions? We could, we could talk for hours, obviously, but uh, we don't want to keep you here that long. <laughs> uh, it's, look, it's a pleasure. You know, all the subjects are very close to my heart. Yep. Yeah, you, you put at the end of each chapter some action items. I know there's also, um, uh, I guess, a video series, an online, an online challenge people can do for the, the Life in Half a Second Challenge. Can you just uh, quickly tell us a little bit about that and how people can sign up to that? Absolutely. So everything uh, that is on that website, which is lifeinhalfasecond.com, is free. It's all free resources. And what I ended up uh, discovering is I got lots of emails from readers and they wanted more information, you know, tell mm. me more or tell me this or tell me that. And I began responding and then, you know, you, you, you're getting five, ten emails a day. And I came up with the idea, God, I'll just create a video series, which is two or three hours broken into these different segments, where I go into more detail on mm. all of these things. I give examples of creating a goal pyramid. I, uh, I tell them how to go and find a mentor or where to start, all of these common questions that I would get. So I've put that all on the website. I think you just have to put in your email address and you have access to all of the resources. And I, I think, uh, when did I look at it last? I think it's 8,000 people that have gone through mm. that so far as, as last time that, that I've looked through it. So it's been enormously rewarding, not in a financial sense, but in a feel-good sense that people are benefiting from it, they're using it, and it's giving them a new, the videos are giving them a new perspective on the content in the book. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Yeah, everyone should go, go out, read the book, sign up to the challenge. Yeah. I think it's a good way to, as you say, achieve success before it's too late. Yeah, and, and, it, and it raises, uh, when you asked earlier some other things that I'm going to do, the... Uh, the other thing on my to-do list, along with this book on how to become an entrepreneur, is I had a friend uh, pass away this year that was uh, a close family friend, and he was 44 or 45, and he got diagnosed with uh, brain cancer and was um, dead three or four mm. weeks later, yes. and he uh, left uh, three young kids behind. Mm. And, and you know, visiting him at the hospital and watching that whole episode made me think, gosh, if I was in his situation at that moment, I'd, I'd make a series of videos that my kids could watch in 10 years or in 20 years with uh, with with you know, my core messages core mm. values core advice on various subjects and that became an inspiration that i'm kind of mapping out now in, in a big <laughs> notebook is to make a large video series that would be completely free and accessible to anyone about all the things that I would uh, kind of tell my kids if I was going to be dying in a week or two weeks. So, oh, you know, a whole video series around a business or a video series around uh, core ethics and values and so forth, value, uh, uh, videos around relationships, et cetera. And it's everything that I believe and have experienced and advice that I would give wrapped up into these discrete segments that um, anyone can benefit from, but it was inspired by this event. God, if I only had a few weeks left, I'd try to, kind of like in Superman, that, that uh, those crystals that he had from his home planet where he could go to the North Pole or wherever and, and hit a crystal and it would give him some piece of content or information from a planet that was lost and everyone had died. Yep. So that's another project that I'd love to do. As, uh, <laughs> if I don't really have enough hours in the day, but, but I'll definitely <laughs> do it. Yeah. Love that, it, sounds, mate. that sounds amazing and a, a good story. Look forward to it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Matthew. Is there uh, yeah, anything else? Or everyone should just head to the head to the website and sign up for the challenge, I reckon. It's a yep. freebie. Yep. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, the, but the last piece of advice is it's you, you know, the best time to start was yesterday, the second best time to start is today. Yes. And uh, you know, none of us are getting any younger. Um, tomorrow's not gonna give us any more advantages than we have today. So if there's uh, anyone that and, – and success means different things to different people. It doesn't have to be money. It can be sports excellence. It can be being a better parent. It, it doesn't matter what it is. But it, each of us have some hidden dream or hidden desire um, or hidden passion that they would like to pursue. And, and all it takes is really just making that first step. And that first step might be opening a book, listening to a video, listening to this podcast. And hopefully it will begin kind of a, a sequence of events. Then there's the next step. Sign up for a video series. It's free. I'll watch the first video. Then you'll set a goal. Then you'll do this. So the core message is the best time to start 
other than yesterday is is right now. So whatever it is, you know, yeah, do it. Start. Go. Yeah. <laughs> <It's a> can't <can-tan. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much, Matty. That was a, that was amazing, and we need to get out there and start as well. <laughs> yeah. Start right now. Uh, gentlemen, it was a great, great pleasure, and uh, very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to kind of share my views and insights with you and your listeners. Thanks, mate. Fantastic. Thank you. It's really it's great. Fucking prime. Yo! Thanks, guys, for listening to the What You Will Learn podcast. We yeah, hope you enjoyed that episode. I if you, yeah, <laughs> right. if, if you like what we're doing, guys, please leave uh, a review. It'll mean a lot, or at least recommend it to one friend. Surely you'd have at least one mate that might enjoy it. Yeah, if they're weird. Yeah. 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 Yeah.